Let's take a look at part two of chapter 11, an introduction to the nervous system in our uh, human anatomy and physiology text. In part two, we're going to be uh, taking a look at memory potentials, you know, something we've already uh, talked about in the context of muscles from chapter nine. So that's nice to have something familiar that we'll be able to just reinforce a little bit. And then we'll talk about the mechanism of conduction of action potentials down uh, neuron axons, which is a little bit unique. And we'll also be talking about encoding of stimulus frequency. So <clears throat> neurons, like muscle cells, have a negative charge in, in the interior of the membrane relative to the outside. It's called the resting membrane potential. Now, why is that? Well, first of all, the sodium potassium pumps are always pumping sodium ions out of the cells and potassium ions in. That means that sodium is very scarce inside the cells, and the kidneys keep plenty of it out here. So we have a big concentration gradient or, or difference that's created by the the pumps. Um, potassiums are being pumped in, so potassium accumulates inside, and the kidneys keep the exterior very low in potassium. So again, we have a huge concentration difference, which represents a, a driving force for diffusion. Likewise, for sodium, an inward driving force, potassium an outward driving force. <clears throat> so that's the conditions of the cells at rest, all the cells in your body for that matter. <clears throat> at rest, secondly, the membrane is slightly permeable to potassium. It's leaky, we may say. It's not like there's wide open channels so the potassium can easily cross the membrane. There are so-called leak channels. And there's, it's easier for potassiums to leak out than for sodiums to leak in. So the net effect is the potassiums escape from the cell. And if you think of the cell as starting out with an equal number of negative and positive charges inside, and some positive charges leak out, and leave behind a net negative interior. That's exactly what happens. Uh, we have a, a resting memory potential of between minus 70 and minus 90 millivolts, typically. This is a, that's a significant amount of charge. <clears throat> and this is just reminding us that potassium, sodium potassium pumps maintain those concentration differences, even though there's these leak currents, uh, potassium is occasionally leaking out and sodium is leaking in, and we have this resting memory potential that's maintained in a steady state. Um, <clears throat> that sets us up to be able to have a stimulation of the cells and action potential, something dramatic happening. And there's two things to think about when understanding how you stimulate a cell to have an action potential and how an action potential actually forms. That involves two types of channels. Receptor channels are bound uh, by neurotransmitter, typically. And when neurotransmitters bind to their receptor channels, they open up and allow ions to cross the membrane. Now, in the context of muscle cells, we said that acetylcholine is released from motor neuron axon terminals, diffuses across the synaptic cleft, and binds to uh, receptor channels on the sarcolemma, the muscle cell. The sodium ions rush in and depolarize the cell. And that's true in many cases with neurons as well. But it turns out that neurons are a little more diverse sometimes when. Uh, when ligands bind to their receptor channels, um, the cell membrane becomes hyperpolarized. So we'll see more about that in a minute. So anyway, that's how we can produce um, changes in membrane potential. And if the changes are sufficient, then eventually some electrically gated uh, channels will open and we'll have an action potential. So here's a little schematic diagram of a ligand gated or chemically gated channel. It's closed when there's no ligand present and the ions cannot cross. Once the neurotransmitter uh, is released from a, from a neuron and, and, and diffuses across the synaptic cleft and binds to this receptor, boom, it opens. And in this case, uh, it's a sodium-potassium channel. We've already uh, seen that when you have a sodium-potassium channel that's open, a nonspecific sodium-potassium channel, more sodiums will leak in than potassiums leak out because they're attracted to this negative charge inside the cell and so will depolarize the membrane. If the membrane starts out negatively charged and some positive charges then enter the cell, it's going to make it less negative. It's going to depolarize. So sodium ions are going to be the net. Uh, the net effect is going to be sodium ions entering the cell. <clears throat> then, if the depolarization is, is sufficient, in this case on the axon, remember that Muscle cells only have electrically gated channels in the perimeter 
of the neuromuscular junction and then spin that on the rest of the cell membrane, but none in the neuromuscular junction. Well, neurons have no electrically gated channels on the dendrites and cell bodies, but they have um, electrically gated channels all the way down the axon. So if there's a sufficient depolarization of the dendrites and cell body of a neuron, then, the, then this, um, this electrically gated sodium channel will open right up, right? Once the membrane is depolarized, you see these little doors swing open as the positive charges repel each other. And sodium ions can rush in and depolarize the membrane further, and that's the beginning of an action potential. And then it spreads down the membrane from sodium channel to sodium channel to sodium channel. And then eventually a wave of repolarization uh, follows it, in which sodium or potassium channels open and repolarize the membrane. So <clears throat> you can imagine um, letting some positive charges into the cell membrane and depolarizing it. But we can also, in the case of neurons, uh, have a receptor channel that is actually a chloride ion channel or a potassium ion channel. Either one will cause hyperpolarization of the membrane. If we open a potassium channel, more positive charges, more potassiums will leak out, and so we'll leave an even more negative potential behind. So the interior of the cell becomes more negative, right? We were at minus 70, maybe 80 millivolts, and dropped down to minus 80 millivolts uh, as a result of these channels being opened by their neurotransmitter. Chloride ions are negative charges that have a gradient such that when the channels open, they will enter the cell and make it more negative inside and again, hyperpolarize the membrane. These are called graded potentials. The amount of change in the membrane potential depends on how many receptor channels are open and thus how many, how many ions are crossing the membrane. Release a lot of neurotransmitter, a lot of channels are being open, and we're going to see a big depolarization as opposed to this little one. <coughs> a lot of um, inhibitory events take place. A lot of inhibitory neurotransmitters released. We're going to see a big hyperpolarization of the membrane. To release the membrane. Well, not as much as depolarization. But. All right. Once we have that happening, once we create that graded depolarization, that, that, that change in membrane potential by, say, letting in some sodium ions because of neurotransmitter channels opening, then those sodium ions diffuse along the membrane. That's called local currents. And as they diffuse along the membrane, they get diluted, essentially, and some maybe leak out across the membrane or ions leak in across the membrane. The net effect is that it, it, it decays, it fizzled out. So here we see in red kind of the area where some ions have come in and depolarized the membrane, some sodium ions. And this graph below shows the amount of depolarization along the membrane. So right where we did the stimulation up here at the top, the sodium ions rush in, we have depolarized the membrane quite a bit. But then as those sodium ions diffuse away from this site of stimulation, um, it, the, the, the depolarization is less and less and less. That's called decay. It kind of fizzles out over distance. So we have to, we really want to get a lot of depolarization all the way to the axon hillock, right? From a dendrite, say, along the cell body's membrane, all the way to the beginning of the axon, we're going to need a lot of, of of excitatory activity, a lot of sodium ions rushing in. Well, if we are sufficiently depolarized and we have an action potential, it'll look like this. We start out with graded depolarization caused by receptor channels opening. And if the axon hillock reaches threshold, that's the amount of depolarization it takes to cause a electrogenic sodium channel to open. If we reach that much depolarization at the axon hillock, then will have an action potential. Electrogenic sodium channels will open and lots of sodium ions will flood into the cell. And look what happens to the membrane potential. Just like in a muscle cell, it goes to positive. Then those sodium channels inactivate or close and the slow potassium electrogenic channels open and the potassium ions go out of the cell, making it more and more negative. And we start re returning to, to the resting membrane potential. In fact, there's a little bit of overshoot that takes place. We hyperpolarize the membrane uh, momentarily. Uh, as the sodium or potassium ions are leaking out, then those potassium channels finally close and we go back to the rest of the memory potential. So graded depolarization in green, and if it reaches threshold, triggering an action potential, which again will spread like a wave down the neuron, the, the axon, down the axon of the, of the neuron. Permeability is the ease, which with, ease with which ions cross the membrane. And this is another way of looking at the, at the changes that are taking place that are actually causing this action potential.
Sodium permeability is very low at rest, very difficult for sodium ions to cross the membrane. But once we reach threshold that a bunch of sodium channels start opening, that means the permeability of first sodium rises. That's what this orange line means. And that's why sodium ions rush out. I'm sorry, rush in and depolarize the membrane. The green line represents the delayed effect of slow potassium channels. The potassium permeability rises a little bit later. It just takes longer for those potassium channels to open. Potassium channels leaving the membrane causes repolarization. The permeability to potassium is shown in green here. Uh, those channels are open. Permeability is hot. Permeability is high. And then those potassium channels close. Permeability goes back down. <coughs> so, <coughs> action potentials begin at the axon hillock and spread along the axon from, cha from sodium channel to sodium channel all the way to the terminals. Right? There's another illustration, yet another illustration. At rest, along the, on the axon are these electrogenic channels, sodium channels and potassium channels. They're closed at rest when the membrane is negative. <coughs> Once we depolarize the membrane due to graded depolarization, due to neurotransmitter channels opening, then an, a sodium channel finally opens due to the, cha the charge difference, and then sodium ions rush in. There's another uh, sodium channel over here that will then open, and, then, and so forth, all along the membrane on uh, depolarization phase of the action potential. Then that sodium channel will inactivate. It's not completely closed yet because the membrane is still depolarized, but it inactivates. It jams up in some way, and no more sodiums can come in. And then finally, these slower, slower reacting potassium channels open, and potassium ions can diffuse out, and that repolarizes the membrane. Some real nice graphics in this chapter. Uh, to, to get us along our way with understanding an action potential or reviewing an action potential. <clears throat> so, the action potential is going to pass down along the membrane. And they didn't show the channels in here. What if we took a voltmeter and stuck an electrode into the axon of a, of a neuron? That's what this is supposed to represent. Yet another way of illustrating um, the change is taking place in action, action potential. At rest, the, the axon is negatively charged inside. We stick our voltmeter in there, wire in there, and sure enough, we see a negative charge inside compared to the outside. That's where the other wire is, but they didn't show it. And what we're going to do is we're going to watch a, a, an action potential sweep down the membrane, and as it passes by our point of view here with our voltmeter, we're going to see a, a change in membrane potential. So we have an action potential starting. Some sodium channels are opening. Again, they didn't draw the electrogenic channels, but sodium channels are opening and depolarizing more and more of the membrane. It just spreads down. And as, as, the, as that wave of depolarization gets to our voltmeter, we see this uh, change in membrane potential from minus 70 millivolts to plus 30. And then that passes by. And as it passes by, then a wave of repolarization follows behind it as potassium channels open and repolarize the membrane. And we're back to rest again. And there again is the same graph we just did a minute ago. Depolarization when sodium electrogenic channels open, they inactivate here, and then so that no more sodium can come in, and the potassium channels open, and as potassium diffuses out, things get negative again inside, hyperpolarizing momentarily, and then going back to rest and memory and potential. Okay, so I hope that was enough examples of what is an action potential to to make it clear in your mind forever and ever. Um, now the next question is, if axons are either off at the resting membrane potential of minus 70 millivolts, or they have an action potential sweep down the membrane, that's an identical event every single time, how can your, how can your central nervous system, how can your brain gather the value of the size of a stimulus. Let's say a sensory neuron on your skin is being perturbed by some something, something's touching your skin and you can feel that. How does your brain know the difference between a something just barely touching your skin and something smacking your skin? Right? There's different, different uh, magnitude or size of the stimulus. How can your brain know that? Well, that's encoded, as we say, by a change in frequency of action potentials. The action potentials are all the same, so that's not the answer. The answer is in the frequency. So here we see a stimulus, a very small stimulus that does not cause depolarization to threshold on our on our 
a sensory neuron and nothing happens. Here's a slightly larger stimulus that does cause threshold depolarization and on the axon, a series of action potentials form and travel down. But if a large stimulus is, is, is encountered, right, the smack on, on the skin, then a high frequency discharge is gonna happen, a high frequency of action potentials, and that's what alerts the nervous system to the size of the stimulus. Increasing frequency means increasing stimulus size that must have been present. So even though this is a binary system, either off or on, off or on, we can still uh, understand magnitude or size or intensity by this frequency change in action potentials. <clears throat> One more topic for, for this section, and that is um, how membrane ch uh, potential changes um, travel along the membrane. So <clears throat> we already said that on the dendrite and, and cell body of neurons, if there's a stimulus that causes a receptor channel to open and some sodium ions rush in and depolarize the membrane, they will spread along the membrane, but it'll, but the depolarization, if it's represented in white, will kind of fizzle out with distance. It will, it will just be, be reduced in effect. If we want to uh, have an action potential, we're going to need to get a lot of, of stimulatory events happening to get enough enough local currents, enough graded depolarization at the axon pillock to get an action potential to start. So that's what graded potentials do. If you're talking about an action potential on the on, a, on the uh, axon of a neuron, in this case a non-myelinated axon, um, <clears throat> we're going to have an electrogenic sodium channel open and if sodium ions rush in and depolarize the membrane, they begin to, fu to diffuse along the membrane and they, they reach a, the next sodium channel in the membrane and it reaches threshold and opens and more sodium ions rush in and it just it just propagates or spreads from sodium channel to sodium channel and spreads all the way to the axon terminals nothing you can do to stop it well that's not how most neurons do it there's a there's a modification of the axon called myelination the myelin sheath is just layers and layers of cell membrane essentially wrapped around in layers uh, on the axon which insulates the axon and increases its capacitance. And <clears throat> there's little gaps in between the areas of myelin sheath. And the way things are arranged on the axon of a myelinated neuron, the sodium and, and potassium electrogenic channels are only found in these gaps between the myelin sheath regions. They're called nodes of Ranvier. Nodes of Ranvier, that's what those gaps are called. That's where the electrogenic channels are. And as it turns out, once we trigger an action potential, the ions that are entering the cell, the sodium ions, can diffuse by local current uh, under the myelin sheath very, very rapidly. And because of the myelin sheath, they don't decay until they before they reach the next node of Ranvier. And now we can sort of refresh the action potential here at the next node. A bunch of sodium ions rush in, and then the sodium ions can diffuse down to the next node and so forth. And the effect of that is to essentially the action potential skips from node to node. The diffusion down underneath the myelin sheath from node to node is essentially instantaneous, extremely fast. The slow part is the opening of sodium channels and sodium ions diffusing in. So this is a slow conduction process. This is a very, very fast conduction process because the action potential again skips from node to node effectively. Some, somewhere up, up, upwards of 100 times faster um, conduction of the action potential, which is essential for the way our nervous system works. You need to conduct action potentials from the tip of your toe to your spinal cord and up to your brain so you can sense what's happening on the bottom of your foot. You need to be able to send action potentials from the brain to motor neurons that operate skeletal muscles at a great distance very, very rapidly. So join me next time uh, as we talk about some more aspects of, of this introduction to nervous system, such as um, various actual specific nervous uh, neurotransmitters, excuse me, and some other topics.